You're listening to the 40 Fit Radio Podcast, dedicated to the 40-plus community. Join us as we discuss the truth about fitness and health using science, reason, and the experiences of our host and content experts. Welcome to the 40 Fit Nation. So, hey, guys, welcome back to 40 Fit Radio, and welcome to the 40 Fit Nation. And we've got Coach Trent here. Yeah, back again. And myself, can't get rid of me. Coach D. No, we can't. I just, I'm like a leech. Oh, just, yeah, mm. yeah. But, yeah, I like you stuck on us, though. But uh, and we also have Carl Shute, starting strength coach. Um, Carl, what else do you do? I know you do a lot of stuff. So, Carl is a f- – I'm going to tell you up front real quick some stats. 48-year-old, five kids – uh, strong as an ox, and I'm going to leave it at that. Now, tell us who you are, Carl. Uh, well, uh, currently I am a full-time uh, strength coach. I work at Barbell Logic. I also work in person at Chicago Strength and Conditioning. That's chicagosc.com. We're on as far northwest as you can get in Chicago and still be in Chicago. I'm there a couple of nights a week. Um, and what else do I do? Uh, I am working at onlinegreatbooks.com. Uh, where we are, uh, you know, reading great books and doing seminars. Uh, what else do I do? I must do something else. I can't remember. You're, hey, you're a dad. Right. Dad yeah. of five kids. What's your age range again? Uh, 16, 14, 12, 10, 8. Wow. It's awesome. Awesome. It's a good spread. It's a good spread. And yeah. uh, your background. So tell us a little, little bit about your educational background, what you've done over the years, just in a nutshell. <laughs> in a nutshell, it's hard to do. I, I have a lot of degrees. Yeah, it's a big nut. So it's, <laughs> it's okay. a lot of, uh, I, I, I didn't know when to quit school. Um, no, my family are all engineers. So I started off with an engineering degree uh, in college. It's aerospace engineering. I guess it's technically rocket science, although I've forgotten, it all, I've forgotten all of it. <laughs> um, I still have the books in my basement, but I don't yeah. know any of that stuff anymore. Something about Newton. Uh <laughs> Uh, but Newtonian physics. Yeah, well, yeah but I, I got a master's in in engineering mechanics. Oh wow! So I didn't stop there. I never really worked in the field much. Worked for a little bit. I uh, spent a couple years in seminary after some life crises. I left on my own power. They didn't kick me out. Then I went and I got a PhD in philosophy from Marquette. I guess that's my highest degree. Very cool. I added a theology degree after that just for fun. And got a starting strength coach in 2012. And I, I would teach in uh, colleges for about 20 years, but uh, I don't do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember talking to Sully and, and he said something like, uh, um, like the work that he does now at Gray Steel is the most doctory things he's ever done. You know, he used to be an ER doc and, and you can't really help people. All you can do is, is patch up their disasters. Sure. But if you work as a strength coach, you can change their life and you can fix them. And I, my response to him was, it's the most teachery thing I ever do, right? I would yeah. teach, you know, 30 kids sitting in a class ignoring my lecture on metaphysics. You know, it, it's depressing. Yeah, But sure. I can take a kid and in 20 minutes I can teach him to squat and I can change his life. Yeah, yeah. And then I can hit the metaphysics, right? Yeah. Right, exactly. right. Well, you can, you can teach him some metaphysics along the way. Because yeah. part of barbell training, as we learned today, with the science committee is metaphysics right so right. yeah I, I tell you the reason why we wanted to have Carl on the on the podcast is number one he, he fits our demographic he's over 40 number two he's crazy strong we're going to talk a little bit about some numbers that he hit yesterday at our starting strength coaches meet for the annual conference number three he just kind of represents the kind of guy that we like to have on the podcast he's got a family uh, he's in our uh, like I said, our age demographic, but he also is a smart, smart guy. He's learned. He comes up with amazing pieces of information that uh, comes from like the, I don't know, 800 BC or something. <laughs> and I, I just love listening to him. Uh, but most importantly, I think he values strength training. And as of recent, within the last year, he had a dramatic weight loss, leaned up, and we're going to talk a little bit about that because he kind of represents the kind of male that we want to see walking around the planet Earth at 48 years of, of age. So, uh, you know, you kind of are prototypically, um, I want to grow up to be like you, even though you're four years younger than me. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit first about your numbers. Okay, how yeah. tall are you? Uh, 5'11". And you weigh about? 
I weighed in at the meet at 240, so I'm a little heavy. He's a big guy. Yeah. I like he's beefy, man. He's like, I call him the mini Hulk. I told him the other day, your new handle is the mini Hulk. Okay, or, I'll take it. He's or perhaps more fitting with his uh, classical background, uh, the Minotaur. The Minotaur. The Minotaur. That would work. Yeah. That w- I was disappointed with the Hulk in Endgame. With the glasses. He, yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know, he was a smaller, like, shrunk down yeah, version. Yeah, he didn't smash. He controlled. He, he controlled. Like, they told him to smash, and he's like, yeah. I don't really want to smash. I don't do that thing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he's too intellectual. He kind of became... It's the postmodern He Hulk. almost yeah, had, like, right. a Hulky dad bod. No, maybe not. It wasn't that bad. He had a cardigan. But, <laughs> <laughs> he did have a cardigan. Okay. Hey, they got to make him a softer, gentler Hulk. Right. You know, they've got to dumb him down. So you did the strength meet yesterday. Yep. You were the oldest competitor in the strength meet. Yep. I think you had the second or third highest total. What were your numbers? Uh, I, I squatted 562 uh, on second attempt. Tried 600 on the third. Didn't quite get it. Um, pressed 257. <laughs> Uh, so 17 pounds above body weight. That's pretty cool. Um, and then I deadlifted a PR for me of 577. Wait, wait, a PR, but you're too old to PR. Uh, you no, just... no, he didn't get the memo. About that. When yeah. do you, so here's a good question. Here's a starting question. When do you think as strength athletes, us older guys stop PRing? Because you've been lifting a long time. You said earlier, right. you've been lifting since college. So this is not exactly like you're a novice that we started at 40 or that we started at 45. Well, so let me correct that. So I, I screwed around in college Bro science, and got like really strong, bodybuilding. at least with the bench press, uh, and then kind of screwed around for a long time. And then uh, it was about almost 10 years ago that I started training seriously when I found, you know, starting strength. Yeah. So it hasn't been straight training that whole time, but. Right, but still, I mean, forty-eight years old, PRing. It's it's mm-hmm. so so. Here's a good question, philosophically: When do the PRs stop? Not yet. <laughs> yeah, I talked to Soli once, and Soli said fifty-seven. No, who who asked him? Someone asked him. I can't remember who asked him. It was Randy Winfrey. <laughs> Randy Winfrey asked him. He's one of our fellow coaches. He said, "When do the PRs stop?" He said he looked at Randy Winfrey and he goes, "For you, fifty-seven." <laughs> Why that was, I have no idea. But um, well, yeah, so I'm a little bit of an outlier. Um, I have, uh, you know, I I got good joints. You know, yeah. I don't ever get hurt. Yeah. Um, knock on wood. There's no wood in here. Somebody needs to knock on wood. Good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I I don't get hurt. Um, and I just keep training. Uh, I can take a lot of volume in my training. Uh, as Robert knows, he's in here. He tried to kill me with volume. Yeah. It, it didn't work. He couldn't kill me. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit of an outlier. So I'm hoping I got some numbers I still want to hit. I still want to hit. And I, I, I want to keep training as hard as I can until the, um, until my body says I can't get any stronger. Yeah. And I'm pretty motivated because the only thing I do, my only hobby is strength training. Yeah. It's cool. You know? Yeah, you're focused. Definitely focused. So there's a, you come to a point, uh, what is a guy going to, like, when is a guy going to not get PRs? Well, it depends on the guy, right? How serious are you? How well is your body held up? Mm-hmm. Um, I've never gotten my testosterone tested. I sus- I know at one time it was real high because I lost my hair at age 14. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what it is now. But if you're, <laughs> you know, if you're a, a pear-shaped middle-aged guy and you don't have high testosterone, you, how long are you going to make PRs? Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah, genetics plays a huge role in that. And I, you know, I've, I've turned 52 in March, so I'm closer to 53 than I was before. And um, and I PR'd working set deadlift today. So, um, and I PR'd this last year at nationals. And I've been an mm-hmm. athlete all my life. You know, yeah. so I was a college gymnast. And what I would say, so. I don't even want to say when you're not going to get another PR. No, it happens when it happens. Yeah, and you're going to, the day you say, I'm not going to get another PR. It was yesterday. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, but that's the day you're never going to get another PR, yeah. right? Yeah, because yeah. yeah. some of that's mental. Some of that's your capacity. Someone asked me the other day, um, when will you, st- what, what was it? When will you stop doing backflips? <laughs> and I said, when I can't do them anymore. And the idea is every year on my birthday, I do them and I'm going to go to Hawaii in a week and I'm going to send some backflips onto Instagram off the beach. So I think that we limit ourselves by our own mental capacity, what we think is the norm. And I'm, I don't want to fall into the norm. And yet I want us to be able to relate to the average listener out there that's on 40 fit radio to say, you do not have to be considered part of the norm if you decide not to be. Um, Right. And some of that's effort driven. 
it's definitely effort driven. It's based on your mental perception and what you choose to accept. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think about this a lot. I mean, there's power lifters in general like to talk about how difficult their lifting is. You know, everybody in this room, right? We all complain, man, my work sets were so hard. It, it, it just, I put the bar on my back and I just hate, no, no, I, I think that's the wrong approach. And I know some people, they just they, like, um, uh, my friend Charity uh, calls it the medicinal <laughs> approach. There's some people that are like that. They lift because they like the, it, it's medicine. Right. I want to move you, as many of you out there listening as I can, to away from the medicinal approach and to the glory approach, right? I was talking to Sully today. You know, do you ever get to the end of a set and you rack it and you're like, take that universe? Oh, you know? oh yeah. Oh, yeah. She's like, yeah, yeah. second law of yes. thermodynamics. You know, screw yeah. you, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, 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 there's something glorious about it. I, I like, I really, really like unracking a heavy squat and stepping back and Absolutely. giving it a good run. It is thrilling and it's not so bad. The discomfort is, it's like what? 10 seconds of discomfort yeah, yeah. and then glory short lived. Yeah. Well, I think, I think what I find is when I get around my group of guys that I know that are similar to my age and they're all talk, they're, they're all very histrionic. They're talking about the fact that they used to do this or they used to do that or they used to do this. And I, I'm, to be honest with you, there are some things I don't do anymore because I've gotten a little smarter. I've developed a little bit more wisdom as I've aged. Mm-hmm. And I know that the risk far outweighs the rate of return at some point. And so, but yet I, I can't relate to that. And I agree 100%. PR'd my dead, deadlift working set today. Awesome. I love it. I love it. I finished that set. I feel like a god. I hate to admit it, but that's an important part of being male. And I think it's an important part of being female, too, that a woman needs to know that she's strong, that she's continue, continuing to improve. And I think develop – I told my wife the other day, she said, well, you know, I'm trying to – I want my thighs – I want a little thigh gap. I said, no, you want thigh clap. Yeah. And I don't mean, you know, the, the Ooh, that. No, I don't t-shirt. mean that. Yes, that's it is a t-shirt, a t-shirt right there. But yeah. you want your thighs to clap together. Yeah. We do not want your thighs to gap. And I and I'll tell you what, this is what's really interesting. We were at we were at, <laughs> I've <laughs> never had a thigh gap. <laughs> <laughs> no, me either. <laughs> me either. They used to call me ham hocks, I even to, as a gymnast. In the summer I gotta go around with the chafing stuff. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we talked about this on a couple episodes ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna offline. I'll talk to you about swimsuits. We'll, yeah. Uh, we'll oh yeah. I just so I just yeah. bought it. I'm going to Hawaii in a week, and I bought two new swimsuits. I bought a Nike Sundra. Do you know what a Sundra is? A Nike Sundra is like a brief. Yeah. It's not. It's not a. It's like not. A, it's, it's like not a Brazilian. A it's like those Brazilian sw- swimsuits, right? The sungas or whatever. No, yeah, it yeah. doesn't go. It's, it's not, not like cut a thong. high in the back, is it? No, 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 no. It's built like a short swimsuit, basically, really short. I bought that, and I bought just a what's called. And Nike makes another suit called the Nike Short Swimsuit. Frank, Frank Sanders recommended the underwater demolition team <laughs> shorts, which yeah. have like a two inch inseam. Yeah, oh. yeah. It's like yeah. I'm thinking awesome. of getting some. You, you should, man, and we should strut that stuff, man. But, <laughs> but I think that you know, both women and men, having a muscular body is a youthful looking body. And so I, I told my wife the other day, she was in the gym and, and, and we, then we were at a resort not too long ago. And I looked at her from behind and I said, you know, at your back, you've got traps. She's like, I know they're kind of bulging up. I was like, it's awesome. Oh my gosh. It looks so muscular. Can I say, I love traps on women. Oh, yes. it's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very it, youthful looking, uh, athletic looking, uh, it, trait. And it tells you, cause you, if you do not lift seriously, you don't get them. I know. And so yeah. if you see a lady with traps, you know, she is serious about yep. lifting and that she yep. is a serious person and you should probably talk to her, yep. right. you know, if you're single and are able to do that. Right. So interesting, interesting point here. Uh, one of my clients that's 48 years old, she was in Mexico at a resort and a woman walked up to her from behind in the pool. They were in the pool and there was a pool bar there and she walked up to her and she tapped on her shoulder. She said, Hey, can I ask you what you do for exercise? And she said, well, I, I barbell train and, and I'm also a CrossFit coach, but, but my coach, my barbell coach won't let me CrossFit much anymore. So I mostly barbell train. I lift barbells. And she was like, really? And she said, well, do you mind me asking you what, what kind of where you live? Do you go to like a barbell gym? She's like, well, I live in Texas. And the other lady said, well, I live in Texas too. And she said, well, where do you live? She said, well, I live in Keller. She said, 
well, I live in Keller too. <laughs> and she was like, no way. And they started talking. I used to go to church with the woman that was talking to my client. I knew her very well. Mm -hmm. And they started connecting, and now she's barbell training her. Yeah. And what got her into barbell training was she saw her traps. Yeah. You know, yeah. and she could tell, wow, this woman lifts. Yep. And she's got a muscular body, and she's almost fifty years old. And so, um, I think I think having that lean mass is a very youthful trait. Um, not only is it very functional too, we can lift heavy stuff. You know? Right. So, so, Carl, you built the lean mass. But you had to do a little bit of work to let it show through, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so tell us about yeah how your body composition <laughs> changed as you started to lift and train seriously. Yeah, so when I, I got into um, – so strength is my number one goal. Um, that's what I care about. I care. There's a couple numbers I care about. I want 600 pounds on some lift. I don't care which one. It's a nice round number. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, if I were French, I probably wouldn't care, right? There'd be some kilogram total that I wanted, but – you know, I'm an American and I want 600. Um, but so when I started training seriously, I just ate a lot of food, uh, and I got stronger. I got a lot stronger, but then I started to taper off and I was 262 pounds. I think the waist was like 41 or 42. Uh, Robert's in the room. He remembers all the numbers. You were fat. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of fat. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You were just fluffy. You still looked muscular. I don't think it was 44. I, mean, it, it, I can look it up, but I was... Yeah, you were fluffy. Yeah. Do you remember at that point, like, kind of where your lifts were, where your numbers were? Uh, okay, so for squatting, <laughs> it can be good to be fat. Okay, if you yes. just want yeah, the numbers. Man. The power belly You just kind of bounce off. If you just want the numbers, yeah. you can put on some weight and get a big squat. So my, my heaviest squat was done at, fi at uh, 262, and that's uh, 585. I almost... I could have beat it yesterday, but I wanted to... I wanted to the bigger PR, um, bench press at that time. I'm not sure what the bench press was. It was like four thirty or four, something like that. Um, uh, I had s waddled up to a sumo deadlift and done five sixty two. And so the way this started, we were at Wichita Falls Athletic Club, and Robert, he's like, Carl, I got to fix your deadlift. That's my Santana imitation. Mm -hmm. Uh. He's trying to fix my deadlift. My deadlift was, was garbage at that time. And, 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 and so was your squat, but that's okay. <laughs> no, the squat was fine. It was, <laughs> man. No, you fixed your squat. Your squat's so much yeah, better. But, you actually started to lean over. So, <laughs> <laughs> did I lean yesterday? I don't think yeah. I did. No, you didn't. But, well, yeah, you lean more than you used to in your Instagram. Videos. I have very short femurs. You, but so you I started to lean, lean over, over more. Yeah, you've yeah. been leaning over more. It's good. Yeah, it's been a lot of work. But Robert offered to to coach me, um, which I gratefully accepted. You know that that would be. I thought that'd be useful. I know he's a good coach. I actually I actually coached him before he became a starting strength coach because uh, he used to live in a town next door to me. Uh, so we were practically neighbors. Uh, but then I, I got some medical. Uh, stuff from a physical that was a little bit worrisome and i don't remember the exact numbers but the word pre-diabetic for real mm. wow. yeah i don't know if we were actually into that territory but you just had some metabolic syndrome yeah kind of well numbers. and it's in the family you know yeah yeah sure and and um he's like we got to fix that yeah definitely and uh you know um so it runs in the family and i don't want to lose any limbs or have blindness or something diabetic neuropathy is no fun Right, right. Lots of bad things happen. Yeah. So if you've read uh, Sully's book and uh, Fat Phil, mm -hmm. yeah, and the me and metabolic syndrome, you don't you don't want that. You want to get rid of that. Right. Uh, and so, well, I told him, you you tell me what to do, and I'll comply. And he did. So we did macro tracking, which I still like. I know um, I don't know. Not too many people can do it, but I love macro tracking. Engineers do. Yeah, I like the control. Yeah, sure. Right? Yeah, I, I really yeah. like the control. Well, so the first month was hard. The first month was really, really hard. And after that, it, it's just annoying. You know, just and doing it's, the work. Yeah, just doing yeah. the work. You know, I'd measure out my my whiskey by the gram. <laughs> <laughs> As your primary carbohydrate source. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many well, carbs did you have? Well, I, I don't had eat a half fruit. a bottle. I, I had, had an, an apple, apple yesterday. Will it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I don't have a sweet tooth, so yeah. um, you know, any like I say, I'm an outlier. I don't, I don't care about ice cream or any of that stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's nice, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't have a big sweet tooth. I don't, I don't seek it out. 
Um, so I don't know that my experience is completely applicable. Maybe. So maybe. The thing I wanted to talk about, the big thing for me for that macro tracking enabled was uh, breaking the link between food and happiness, mm. uh, which sounds like a bad thing, but it's actually a good thing. Um, so all the religions in the world have fasting as part of their mm-hmm. discipline. Sure. Right. And uh, like, I mean, if you think of it in a certain way, the Garden of Eden, the sin was breaking the fast. They weren't supposed to eat that thing and then they ate it. They, they, they broke their macros, right? Right. Right? Right. They didn't hit their macros. <laughs> the holy macros, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, Nutritional theory actually started in the garden. <laughs> uh, but uh, so the reason for that, if you think about it, there's generally a reason. If there's something that a billion people believe, you know, the practices are going to make some sort of sense with human right. nature. I'm not making any theological claims. Just, you know, fasting makes sense to some degree. Right. Um, and it makes sense because, you know, we live through our bellies. The appetites yeah. are the rudders of the soul. I think Aristotle put it that way. Um, that uh, I can steer you if I know what you love. Mm. And I can make yeah. you do what I, what I want. Um, well, if you can control what you love, then you can do other things. So if you consider macro tracking as is this it's going to sound weird, but as a spiritual discipline, you yeah, know, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. I think, I think in some ways you could consider that a denial of self habit habit yeah. where you're starting to say no to yourself, which is good. A sense of self discipline and will. I think, you know, if you look at religion, we talk about religion a little bit, but we could go into a deep wormhole that you could probably drag me into more deeper than I'd <laughs> like to be. But uh, if we talk about religion and we just talk about the denial of self, it is the concept of moderation that humans do very poorly at, that right. they want to they wanna migrate to one opposite pole or another. And when it comes to nutrition, moderation is very, very important. Right. Yeah. Here, let me, do, let me give an evolutionary view of religion since uh, Robert talked about why we, why we want, why we like fat so much. Yeah, satiation right. and right. that whole, yeah, yeah. Um, Self-preservation. Type so... Uh, you know, you kill the mammoth, you are going to eat until you can't eat anymore because you don't have a refrigerator. And then you're going to get, you're going to rest and then you're going to go eat some more. You you're don't know when your next meal is going right, to come. You're going to stuff yourself full of mammoth yep. and you're going to eat the fatti- fattiest part of the mammoth yep. you can uh, because you're living in a time of scarcity. Mm-hmm. Well, all right, agricultural revolution. Agrarian. Yep. Now, now we don't have scarcity. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which is also the time of the you know, rise of religions, at least the ones that we know about. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't live like that anymore. You know, if you've got grain in the silo, you can't eat yourself silly all the time. Right. Yeah. So, all right, let's have some fasting. (laughs) Let's have some moderation. Moderation becomes necessary once we're prosperous. Yeah. Now the resource that was so readily available, you know, whether it wasn't readily available now is now we have to learn how to, how to control. Don't you want to eat mammoth? Wouldn't you love to eat some mammoth? I, I've, uh, I've eaten bison. Is that okay? Is that close enough? Bison is kind of like a mammoth. I mean, it's woolly and it's big. Yeah, and it, it doesn't has have horns. a tusk. It's, well, yeah, it has I, horns. It's it seems to be like a, be kind of like a big yak, and I've never really felt. Uh, why'd you? You got to wait till they uncover one of these in Siberia, and then go yeah. over there and cut a steak out. It's true. Yeah, there you go. It's like Wagyu. Oh my gosh. Mammoth. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. I raised my own beef. I'm good with that. <laughs> that's They're in the same species, but, I'm you know, sure. Bovine species. You so. know, I, I was thinking what you're saying is uh, I, I immediately thought of, um, you know, it's, it's the way we train animals, right? Right? We train them through the stomach and um, mm-hmm. we can control their behavior through their, um, just the, the intense drive for food. And so I guess part of accessing our higher nature, if however you want to consider that, is being able to divorce ourselves from our instincts and our base nature, and um, in one way is through practices of self denial. Yeah, but the thing is, once you um, once you do it, so I'll give you an example. So in in um, the church where I attend, if we're going to do before Easter, if we're going to do it, Christy knows about this. If we're going to do this for real, it's no meat, no dairy for forty days. Okay. That's Orthodox Lent, or I'm mm. actually, I'm Eastern Catholic, but sure, you know, it's the same thing. And I, I've done it once. <laughs> uh, I do some kind of, kind of moderate version of it most years, but uh, if you do the whole thing, boy, by the time you get to Easter Sunday and you can have that buttered 
role, you enjoy it like a hundred times more oh, yeah. than oh, anybody yeah. else does yeah. ever. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So it, it's not it's not a matter that you don't enjoy food. You right. probably I think you enjoy it more once you can sure. manage you it more. Right. Definitely. Once you can get yourself some self discipline on this, mm -hmm. then when you go out and you get your ice cream or uh, you go out with your friends and have that, you know, have the beer or whatever, you they are having it. Not to talk bad about your friends. They're having it because they have to have it. Right, right. You're having it because you want to have it. Yeah. And that's better. Yeah. Well, we, and I, I like what you're saying, too, in the, in the sense that, that when we talk about some of the life habits that you've developed as an older male, I'm just going to use that term, you know, as a male in his middle age, you know, yeah. you're, you're, you're almost at the 50 mark, brother. You're almost I on know, the other I side. Know. So, but you, you're developing habits that are great life habits for your quality of life and are very good to develop just overall health in, in more areas than just your physical body. And so the sense of self-denial, learning self-discipline, in a society that's very gluttonous, learning yeah. how to do something hard, learning how to uh, focus on your physical body and your spiritual body, all those things have value. And I think we live in a society that's full of excesses, and being able to, uh, that's one of the things I love about barbell training is it, it's that sense of voluntary hardship. And I don't even like to use the term voluntary hardship anymore because it's, I don't, I don't even really consider it a hardship. It's an opportunity. It really well, is an opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, the fact that I have a rack in every single one of my clinics and I have a rack in my gym and I'm about to have a rack out at my ranch, you can't really call that a hardship. Right, That's right. an opportunity. It's glory. Yeah, right? it right. is. Yeah, it is glory. glory. Yeah. And so, uh, but I think that those are important. Those are important skill sets and they're important yeah. um, opportunities for us to take advantage of. Well, well we've talked about before on the show the, the, the hedonic treadmill, you know, and it's, and it's the... The hardship comes into play in that as we consume a greater level of luxury, at first it's like the buttered roll, right? Mm -hmm. If you're starting from your baseline is zero, right? It's an incredible luxury, but you have it again, well, it's still really pretty damn good. Yeah. You have it again, eh, it's starting to normalize, right? Diminishing and it returns. Diminishing returns. And pretty yeah. soon it becomes normal, now it's your new baseline. And so, so to actually not eat the buttered roll is it is suffering by definition because you now have to lower your consumption below baseline. Yeah. Well, let's say, so, um, so there's this ethical theory called utilitarianism and I actually don't think it makes complete sense, but let's pretend it does. And if we're going to, um, maximize pleasure, you know, if you want to find more, come to onlinegreatbooks.com and I'll talk about utilitarianism to you. Uh, but uh, let's plug, presume... Plug, commercial plug. Uh, you want to maximize utility. And by that, they mean pleasure, at least yeah. in the classical form of it. So imagine there's units of pleasure. There aren't, but imagine there were. Okay, um, call them Benthams, after Jeremy Bentham. True. And I think if you, if you just eat whatever you want, the typical American diet you might get like a thousand Benthams a week. Whereas if you moderate your diet and you save up your fun, maybe for Sunday afternoon with your family, I think you might be at 2000. It's more valuable. Yeah. You'll, you'll enjoy the high point so much more than just the fatty high carb food every day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you'll, you'll end up on top. Yeah. No, that's a good, good theory. And I think it's, I think it's a, an appropriate theory. I think that you ultimately at the end of the day, the ability to train your body physically, the ability to stay in shape as we get older, to also focus on good quality habits. And I think it influences more than just your physical body. It influences a lot of other parts of your um, person or your human experience. Um, and the most important thing is, is I think that, uh, you know, we're all, we're all, as we age, we're all looking for, I hate to use the word fountain of youth. I know that I won't be 20 again, but I sure feel pretty darn close to 20 than most people, I think, in the sense that I, I, it's amazing how we have this human perception because we've been told this, that as we age, we're going to feel a certain way. So everybody just kind of falls into that and they just kind of, they're like cattle being led to, you know, the trough, you know, they just kind of fall in line and they just kind of go down the, go down the alleyway there. And, uh, I think there's a better life than that. And oh, I think yeah. you there, represent part of that. Better there life. is, you know, uh, okay. So, uh, speaking of church, there are these moments in our services where they're, they're able to sit 
people are so desperate to sit. You know? <laughs> like I just feel a slap of the everyone's yeah, butt hitting this like, pew. And so I'm looking there, I'm looking at them, and, and I love these people. It, it's not personal, but I'm looking at it, and I know they're a representative sample, right? Sure. For most people, standing is a strenuous activity. Now, pause and think about that for a minute. Standing. Your normal posture as a as a human animal. It's exercise. Oh. Standing in, my patients tell me that standing and walking, I, do you exercise? Yes, I walk. Right. I, you know what oh, I tell gosh. them? I tell them this. That's normal human locomotion. Yeah. You cannot consider yeah. that Jim exercise. Jim Wendler writes about this. He, he's like a... a he had been a, um, a, I think, an equipped power lifter, and he'd gotten real heavy, and um, and he's um, he's getting out of it. And somebody recommended to him walking. He's like, walking? What? <laughs> walking? Are you kidding? You That's know, like he saying, squatted a thousand times right, in a right. suit. He's gonna walk that, uh, or sleeping? <laughs> yeah, or sitting. <laughs> Just recommend dying. Come on. That's, that's how that's how low that's how low the threshold has become, or the expectation yeah. level of the older population. Yeah, you don't is have it, to be that way. You yeah. can be better than that. You don't have to be the sort of person that standing is a workout. Right. I agree. Right. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that's really interesting is is you know we started off the show talking about yeah we'd like to ask you about your the process of leaning out and how that went for you as a forty plus male, but what you have described is that. For you, there had to be a clear motivation for you to even want to do it in the first place. Because you mm -hmm. said strength was your number one goal. Yeah. And um, you found that there was sufficient motivation in realizing that, hmm, well, I, I can do other things if I can learn how to control my cravings for food. Right. Right. And um, I think that's... And get stronger, actually. The training's gone better. Yeah. That, and that's, yeah. You feel you better, go. too. Right. You yeah. feel better, too. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think that's that's really powerful. Is is we often talk about the hacks, and as if the 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 goal of losing weight and losing body fat is already assumed, and it you know that's that is kind of the surface goal. But where's the motivation? Well, um, you know, with him, when you think about it, without getting you off your train of thought, mm -hmm, train, yep, the readiness to change was that you had a, a perceived susceptibility to a problem. Yes, and it became yeah. real, and that problem was pre-diabetes right yeah so that was the catalyst that got you moving towards your goal what i find though is that once you get off your existing habit set and you move towards these new habits these new self-denials disciplines whatever you want to call them all of a sudden you realize man this is a little harder than i thought it was going to be like you said the first 30 days was kind of yeah mm -hmm. and i found the same thing i've recently wanted to lose some weight for just to look better and feel better cuz i gotten heavier for nationals mm -hmm. um but w what i found was wow this is really good for me i feel more accomplished i feel more disciplined now to being able to say no and not just eating anything that i see or anything that i want to see and to me, it actually has improved my happiness factor. Right, right. <laughs> but I'm, I'm eating less of the foods that I thought I wanted. Yeah. The, when <laughs> so it's when so you manage to do it, yeah, when you manage to do it, it's not a hardship. No. It's better. It's a yeah. better life. Yeah. And I, you might not be able to see it, you know, if you haven't done any of it, if you haven't yeah. managed your, your food, uh, but it, it really is better on the other side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. So what were you going to say, Trent, too? You were going to yeah, say... Yeah, no, I think that's great. I think that's great. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I just think that uh, we, when we talk about nutrition and, you know, we just had um, Robert Santana on the podcast talked about strategies and tips and tricks for eating out and trying to kind of manage your overall, keep you, keep you on track without going totally off the rails while you're eating out. And um, that's great. You know, there's, there's, there's definitely a certain utility to that, but... Sometimes I think we get stuck in kind of the hack mentality, and we've talked about this before too. And it's hard to hack your way to something without having a clear underlying motivation for what, why you're doing what you're doing, right? yeah. and understanding why, why exactly it is you're doing what you're doing. And it's not, well, I'm doing it to lose weight. That's not the answer. The answer is that I have this susceptibility that I can't yeah. not the, eat this the food. I loss, have to eat this food. The weight loss is the is the symptomatic that's right expression of what the underlying issue is or the underlying yeah. reason is. imagine what you could do if you could change what you loved yeah you i know? love that yeah uh i i used to get my happiness from eating the entire pizza 
<laughs> we all did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was it was a place. They're also not, eighteen. <laughs> yeah, th- it's maybe. not in business anymore. I love this place. It was University Pizza. They get yeah. it would come in a square box, and I would just uh, order it. It was so it. good, it was so good. We need to order pizza right now. <laughs> <laughs> but now, so I still love pizza. I really sure, do. Sure, I don't need to eat the whole thing. Right, and that's freedom, right? So that's shifting what you love. Um, I love um, other things more than the pizza and imagine you know how sad was i that i was a kid that that uh, uh, you know like 18 year old where the highlight of my life is calling the pizza place you know that's yeah. not that's not right. great <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're probably like every other 18 year old too i hate to admit it but uh, you know we're we're operating with a little less maturity back then than we are now too we have some insight that we didn't have then we value some things more importantly now than we did then. Yeah, but when do you develop Life your habits? Is, well, when you're really, really young. Yeah. Really young. Yeah. You know, so you're right. I mean, if, if you had carried on that same habit line or thought line throughout your life and hadn't learned how to improve and develop some moderation or some control or some self-discipline or some will, um, you'd be in a different place than you are today, too. So, yeah. And, and we know adults like that. We know adults who haven't developed that. And so I think that um, uh, having some self-discipline, I, physical training for me is more than just, and I, I know it is for you too, Carl, if, and for Trent. Physical training for me is more than just, I want to be strong. It's more than that. That is the outflowing of the fact that I train. But it does so much more for me than just make me strong. It's my quiet place. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a place of refuge for me. It's my place to release it's an area of my life where I st- where where it doesn't matter what's going on in the political environment, what's going on in the world around me. Sometimes I can close the door to the gym, and I know that I can get my work done. Whether it's a good training session or bad, I still know that I can do it. Right, and right. it's good. It's yeah, good. here, think of it this way: so um, stuff that's going on in the world, we have an inflated sense of how much we can affect that. Right. Yeah, definitely. If we give so with with twenty four hour news and and phones that beep you with alerts and everything. Uh, you're internet. always on high alert, mm-hmm. thinking that you can fix something that came across your phone notifications, and you can't. Right. You, you got to shut them off. Right. But you know what you can affect? Your strength. Yep. Got to the squat rack. You can affect that. That's what you can control. The other stuff will take care of itself, you know. Yeah. Or not, but you'll at right. least be strong. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's good. Yeah, and I, w- I wanted to uh, take a minute to plug online great books for a minute because this is what I love about um, what you do. I don't read enough books. I there you go. Do online great books. Yeah. Need what if you could change? What we if would you could love cha- to have you. That, I think that's a tagline for you. What if you could change what you love? What if you don't love reading books? You could change that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I read audio books. <laughs> um, so do I. <laughs> It's like a Yogi Berra. <laughs> um, but what I, what I love what y'all do at Online Great Books um, is that the emphasis is on the Socratic method of teaching, right? And just discussion, right. just reading the books and discussing them in a small group. And you're one of the seminar leaders that, yeah. that leads group discussion. And the emphasis is not on teaching anything. Right. I get fired if I teach. That's part of the rules. That's right. Yeah. It's yeah. explicitly forbidden. Um, the important thing is to kind of poke people and help them help them question and then understand why they believe what they believe. Because otherwise, just like our habits, our beliefs are often just handed down to us through our, our family, mm-hmm. our culture, parents. Yeah. And if we don't really examine them at any depth, then we'll then never change. Yeah. So they're, Socrates, they're not ours. Yeah. Socrates says in the Apology, um, it's the quote everybody gets from him, but they don't give you the complete, the complete quote. So the quote is the unexamined life is not worth living. And that's not quite what he says. He says the unexamined life is not worth living for a man, for a human. It's fine for a pig. Sure. Right? But for a human being, you have reason. You have an, a will and an intellect for whatever reason you have it. Uh, you're the animal that's able to think about himself and, and, you know, see the future and make plans, you know, your dog may love you. That's fine. But your dog doesn't plan for three years ahead, right? Your dog is not staying up at night worrying about the end of the world. <laughs> uh, 
unless it's a very strange dog. <laughs> And he's and he's on online great books, right? So, yeah, that's right. but you're or a, she or she, so right? It you're could a, be a female. Book. You're a, you're a human being that that can think about this. You can yeah. think about your place in the world. And when we run seminars, so what we do, we'll read a book from somebody who's really smart. So it's not me. So uh, I'm, Plato's my favorite for this sort of thing. Uh, we start with Homer, but Plato's a big deal. And Pl so Socrates is is a character in Plato's dialogues who's a model for me, and. You can get frustrated reading these dialogues because Socrates doesn't tell you what to think. And you're like, Socrates, all you're doing is poking holes in other people's ideas. Why don't you tell us what you think? Well, he doesn't usually do that. Um, he's not going to give you the comfort of a PowerPoint slide. What is virtue? I don't know. <laughs> You know, uh, let, what do you think, Mino? And Mino will say a bunch of things and Socrates will say, well, if that's true, I don't think that works out quite right. And you get to the end and you still don't know, but you know it wasn't what Mino thought and you've probably thought quite a bit about it in the meantime. Um, it's made you more human uh, to do this sort of work. And it's something we don't do very often uh, these days you know, we consume a lot of slogans. We don't do a lot of thinking or having conversations. And uh, so I, I'm making a speech, but the, the yeah. last, the no, last thing on this, no, truth. I think it's good. Yeah, yeah it's good. Yeah. So, uh, in a, you know, I have opinions about everything, but in a seminar, I don't. You know, I don't care what you come up with. I care that you come up with something. Yeah. Yeah. That you've thought it through. That that you've come up with something that you believe. I want to know what you think. Because I want you to think. Right. And and I think the, the thing that's important there is that if you don't, like you said, it, we, we consume a lot of slogans. If you aren't willing to do the thinking, if you don't go there and do this kind of thinking, somebody else will do it for you. Mm -hmm. And they already have. And you've listened to eight million advertisements, you know, since you were a kid. And you don't even know that they're doing the thinking for you, but they have. And so in some ways, your behaviors aren't 100% your own. Right. I used know? to use this example in class. I'd look around the room and every, I, I'd say, I've noticed none of you are wearing a kilt. Why? It's a perfectly good piece of, <laughs> of apparel. Why aren't you wearing a kilt? You know, and they're all, what are they? They're all wearing jeans or, or nowadays, late, later in my academic career, they're all wearing sweatpants, you know, yeah. and, or shorts. Um, or, uh, yeah, yoga, yoga pants. Yeah. A little bit later it was yoga pants. Yeah. But uh, none of them are wearing a kilt. Well, why? Because the kilt is not presented to them as a choosable item of clothing. It's not in their horizon of choices. Your horizon of choices is set for you by other people. And if you don't ever think about those choices, you know, then, then you're stuck with it. Maybe, it, maybe right. you should wear a kilt. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, a kilt is a pretty uh, innocuous uh item of clothing, but what if it's political choice? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I think the, the point there is too, is that here's a great example and we could go down into whew, very deep rabbit hole here, but the idea of retirement, the idea of retiring and, and collecting shells on the beach when you turn 65, I'm a strong believer that retirement is a Western, uh, cultural myth. And that the reality is, is that we function better as humans when we are working until we die. Now, we may, be, we may have some opportunities and choices along the way that allow us to work differently as we age. And maybe we have more recreational time and we make to, may take little sabbaticals. But physically, we should always be pushing the limit to some extent um, because that's what's going to maintain our health. And, and if we look at, at human health statistics, over the, when, when men retire... We see that those who stay active and those who stay physically active and doing something and are purposeful, they live longer with improved quality of life. Those who don't die quicker with less quality of life. And so, you know, I think that there are many things like that, that our, that our age range and that our population has adopted as the norm, like, like you had said about the kilt. The norm was not to wear the kilt. So it wasn't even in their, their, their choice of options, yeah. you know. Who should decide that? And I think we should decide that individualistically in regards to what our choices are. Yeah. I, I want let the choice. society choose it for if, us. If I make the wrong choice, at least I want to make it. Yeah. Absolutely. And maybe blue jeans are a better choice than a kilt. Okay. But did you ever think about it? Right. Yeah. 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 
No, that's great. That's great. That's great. So, and that's what online great books does. That's right. That's Get right. So if you, <laughs> I'm already thinking now. <laughs> so if you want to, if you want to do this, where do you start? So like, just like we start physical training, we start by doing a little strength novice linear progression. We squat, we press, we deadlift. Well, the the intellectual equivalent of that is reading. Homer and Plato and yeah, Aristotle, so right? we actually the the name of the company at the beginning was Intellectual Linear Progression, which we were borrowing a concept um, from Mark Ripito and Starting Strength, the Novice Linear Progression, but we were applying it to the realm of the intellect, where thought has progressed. This thing called civilization is about six thousand years old, just because we don't have any writing earlier than that, and it all happened in an order. And the newer writers read the older writers. Um, and we don't read everything because we don't have we we don't have time to read everything. We're mostly doing Mortimer, Mortimer Adler's list with a, an addition or two. I think we added Cicero. Uh, but so we start with the Iliad, which is this fantastic, fantastic. It's I say a lot of books are my favorite book, but this is my favorite book. Fantastic war story. Um, rage, sing goddess, the rage of Peleus' son Achilles. Yeah doomed that sent so many heroes down to death carrying for the birds and dogs you know it's thrilling you know, you start right in the middle of the action and and uh you're like well why why is achilles so mad <laughs> you know? uh, but you find out you know uh, you knew achilles in high school yeah <laughs> and hector and agamemnon was probably yeah, your principal sure, Ag- sure. <laughs> uh, uh, you knew all these people these are our, our types and and the story's thrilling, and I, I, I get choked up. Book nine, especially right now. Uh, no, book six. The end of book six gets me right now uh, when Hector uh, comes in to greet his wife and, uh, the and boy. The son, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's um, all in, in his armor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, so everybody after this, at least in, in our strand of, of civilization, the Western strand, um, everybody's read the Iliad. And it's like... Um, we were sitting in the lobby talking rock and roll lyrics earlier, I yeah. think yesterday. Yeah. And, and uh, so we have a bunch of lyrics in common. They all knew the Iliad by heart. This was their, their, uh, their currency. And so then you go read, if you're going to read Plato or you're going to read Euripides or, or these Greek plays, the Greeks invented drama. It's pretty cool. Uh, but they all, they're all working in this world that's created by the Iliad. Well, the Odyssey too, you know, um, and then uh, you go later than that, and you read Aristotle. Aristotle's read all the stuff before him, mm-hmm. you know. And you get further in philosophy. You get to the Stoics; they've all read this, read this stuff. Um, you get even to uh, the Christ, Christian strand, which is like a melding of strands. You get so um, Jesus quotes Aeschylus hmm. when he says that a, that a, a prophet has no honor in his hometown. Mm-hmm. That's from Aeschylus. So the Greek culture and the Hebrew culture mixed, you know, you wouldn't get that. You don't get the inside jokes if you haven't read the earlier stuff. Right. Uh, it is a continuous strand, a conversation about, well, about what it means to be human, how to live, what's the best life, what is justice, uh, you know, um, is there a God? <laughs> Are there demands made us uh, on us? What What is ethics? You know, is there a way you ought to live? Smart people have been thinking about this forever, and we have six thousand years roughly of of writing about it. Most of it written in the last three thousand years, and uh, it's cool. You know, why would you reinvent the wheel? Right. Right. Yeah. Plus, plus, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. fun. Well, yeah, that's the thing. It is a lot of quite. That was one of the things that. Um, I read the Iliad and did one of the podcasts with online great books with Scott. Yeah. I think it was one of the first ones we did and uh, rereading that because I read it back in college. I was like, man, this is a, it, I mean, it's kind of like watching a movie. It's like watching Save It Private Ryan and it's brutal. You know, it's, it's it, Homer pulls no punches in terms of describing war, but it's also, it's a fun adventure story in a way too, especially when you get the Odyssey, which, mm-hmm. which is much more so an adventure story, but yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's interesting. Sometimes, um, you know, sometimes we're talking the nuts and bolts of training. Sometimes we're talking about intellectual <laughs> nuts and bolts. <laughs> I think, yeah, and, and, and you thought you came here cause you wanted to lose weight, but that, no, it was a little bit more. than It's that. all about improving the self. <laughs> yeah. Don't you want to be a complete improving man or a complete woman? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're more yeah. than your belly. 
Yeah, right. And you don't want to be unicompartmental. I mean, you don't want to be uh, developing physically alone is only part. And how many times have we talked about physical training that, that it does so much more than just make us strong. Like we said earlier, it makes, it improves all areas of our life. And I think online great books and things like that, where we are um, delving into the self when it comes to philosophy, uh, great Western works of literature, spirituality, all those things, developing that portion. Very few people in our society today um, cause we're so bombarded by commercial, you know, by, by just an ongoing commercial that we don't t- take time to think about, uh, the things that we're talking about. Yeah. We yeah. don't take the time out to really think about so a sense of self-awareness and self-examination and all those things, which I think just sharpen us and make us better as humans, make us much better people. And so you got anything else? We didn't talk much about the diet. We don't have to talk about the diet. <laughs> I think this was better than the diet. I bet you ate a high protein, um, and I bet you ate at least 200 grams of protein a day. Yeah. And I bet you ate uh, moderate carbs and moderate fat. Whatever the, fat was the-, the fat was as low as I could manage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we would trade exactly. fat for carbs. Yep. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it, and the training was, was hard. We kept the volume. We kept as high volume as we could. We kept intense volume. So I remember doing like eight sets of three on the bench press. Uh, that was your, so on a, on a week where you would be double bench pressing, in other words, you would have two sessions that week. You weren't in, in a standard LP though, were you? No, no. It was yeah. an intermediate program. Yeah. Yeah. So we were trying to hold on to strength. I actually did PR my bench press on the cut, which was weird. Really? Well, Cause I'm That's a freak on the bench press. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, it's not supposed to be able to happen, but it happened. And, uh, yeah, it, it's not fun to train in a cut, but no. It's not cancer. You yeah, know, it's no. not horrible. As we said earlier, I, I think I've lost um, in two and a half weeks. I've lost or less than two and a half weeks. In about two weeks, I've lost seven pounds and PR to deadlift. You know. Yep. Um, I've noticed the upper body lifts are suffering the most. They're not suffering in regards to that I can't hit my lifts, but it's harder. It's yeah. definitely harder. Yeah, it, it's it, definitely yeah. harder. Yeah. So don't expect to get a, a lot stronger when you're cutting, but. Uh, you don't have to get a lot weaker. That's right. Yeah. 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 All right, man. Well, I think we're done. All right. Yeah. Got an older guy getting stronger and also teaching us how to read some great books. That's right. Grow our minds and our spirits. So, Carl, where can we find you on the social medias? Uh, the Instagram is Carl SSC. Uh, and you can find me at Online Great Books or at Barbell Logic Online Coaching. I'm around. <laughs> You can find me. Carl gets yes. around. Also, I will say, if, if, if nothing else, you got to follow online great books uh, for the dank memes. There's some excellent... <laughs> we have a meme master yes, working for us. A, they have a great meme master, so uh, they're definitely worth following for that. Yeah, Carl is yeah. one of our colleagues that I consider to be probably... He's one of the most learned and just well-read guys that I know and just uh, represents the quality of individuals that we have as strength coaches and colleagues. And thanks for being with us today. Carl's a genuinely awesome person to start with. So that bodes well for him. So I'm right back at you. Thanks yeah, for having me. Great guy. Thanks. So uh, thanks for joining the 40 Fit Radio podcast. You can check us out on Instagram at 40 Fit Radio. You can check out Trent at Marmalade Cream, myself at DR Deaton. You can go to 40 Fit Masters Community Group in Facebook, and then you can also find us info at 40fit.com for email. And uh, thanks for coming uh, to the podcast or just being here. Thanks for listening to the podcast. And thanks for joining the 40 Fit Nation.